Given all that we've said about where we are and the tightening curve, everything we've seen, how do you manage your portfolios these days? One thing that we're thinking greatly about, David, is our international equity exposure. So when we think about global equities, we look around the world and we look for the opportunity set. One thing that stands out to us that's probably a little bit overextended at this point is international developed equities. Over the past one year, the S&P is down 4%. International developed equities, you know, Europe and Japan, are up almost 7%. Mm. That is a very big disparity in returns between those two parts of the world. For Europe, it had been priced for a very big, very bad recession. It didn't transpire. They had much warmer weather than had been expected. But we don't think that all those great things that Europe averted, or the luck that Europe had in averting some of that disaster over the past year, is likely to be repeated. So we're actually keeping our assets closer to home in the U.S. We think that the Fed is one of the first central banks, or major market central banks, that has raised interest rates. It's likely to be one of the first ones to stop. And we think as the world slows down, the dollar is likely to get a little bit stronger as it mm flight to safety and somewhat quality in the U.S. So we're staying a little bit closer to home, but we're barbelling it with some exposure to the emerging markets because we do realize that there's been a lot of stimulus put into the pipeline. And we think that, again, emerging markets are so cheap at this point. If you can hold them for a three to four to five year period, you're likely to be very pleased with your portfolio. Okay, Sarah, so to some extent, Barbara's talking your equity book here. You specialize in equities. Where are you in developed market equities these days? Well, for developed markets, and Barbara has a point, that Europe and Japan have outperformed the U.S., really more Europe. The Euro stocks 50 is up 11 percent year to date in dollars. That's not even a full three months. However, <laughs> that's a rather short time period. Non-U.S. developed has vastly underperformed the U.S. over the last decade. And I've heard this from clients. You know, they, they get very anxious. But so it might be quite some time, if you think about it in that longer context, for non-U.S. developed to catch up with the U.S. And there's still a significant valuation discount for non-U.S. versus U.S., in part due to the different sector weights in the two areas. The U.S. has much more in the way of technology. And year-to-date, interestingly, in a broad global context, technology has led along with consumer discretionary and, and communication services. So investors are still really interested in tech. There's, um, like, I just say, this is the environment we're in. It's one of active management. With rising rates, you just can't buy an index anymore, in my opinion. You have to have a manager who can sift through and, let's say, go to non-U.S. developed and find the stocks that haven't yet had their earnings recovery recognized some of them haven't even gone into a downturn. I mean, Barbara noted the tightening cycle, and I mentioned this as well, it's a little bit lagged in Europe. Well, with all that additional tightening, there may be more casualties. So being very careful about price entry point, being extremely cheap in terms of what you'll pay is a, is a way to avoid those pitfalls. Uh, so, so, Barbara, you are responsible for asset allocation at mm -hmm. Loya. Yes. As you look at that, do you agree that the days of beta are largely past this? We gotta, uh, we, we gotta really go with Alpha. We gotta make yeah. stock picks. Look, we at, at Voya, we have both products that go in active and passive management. We're very focused on fees for our clients. We're managing money for retirement. Mm -hmm. And we know the single best thing we can do is keep our costs low. That helps those, that compounding of returns over time. Um, there are periods when active management goes in and out of favor. I think it was a really difficult road for active management for a while. But we find pockets of the market that are very strong for active management. U.S. small caps are a great place for active management. Um, the value sector also very good in active management. But I would say for the lion's share of it, we do try to really keep our fees as low as possi possible, which generally means we, in the big cap places, we tend to go passive. So I'm curious, Sarah, there's a lot of discussion, obviously, about fees when it comes to active versus passive. As an active manager, how do you make sure you don't lose all of your gains in the fees? Well, just be very careful with fees. But the others <laughs> de deliver significant gains. And if I think about the stocks that a, that a value manager like Causeway would own, we're constantly looking for what the market hasn't yet recognized. And that's very difficult to do in passive. Passive is wonderful if there's monetary accommodation. And that's the environment we were in until a year ago. It was just a year ago the Fed started raising rates. And now assets don't all rise. 
and that's the difference. So, for example, the advertising industry has been really tough, or, or the market for advertising. So stocks like Alphabet have been awful. But at some point in time, the valuation will be low enough, and then the, the stock will cycle back up again. That isn't going to be captured necessarily in index. It just keeps falling in its weight. And so you don't get more of it. You get less of it. And conversely, in an index, you get a lot of what's already done well. And that's all fine if everything is doing well. But, yep. but we're in a totally different environment now thanks to central banks.